guys and gals, never here for Drake Wing Gaming. It's something to me on Twitter, the Gaming Drag. Today, I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of Minotaur Hotel. So, y'all, before we jump into it, just wanted to let y'all know that our Patreon is now up. And for as little as $5, y'all can help support the channel. We've got Bronze Tier for $5, Silver Tier for $10, and Gold Tier for $15. Each come with their own exclusive rewards and permanent access to our community Discord server and future access to all upcoming Not Safe for Work videos, y'all. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump right back in. Alarm Chain, you are up. And let's go. There we go, chapter four. Okay. Your shadow extends long into the chamber, turning irregular over the floor's jagged rocks. As your eyes settle down, you gaze upon it, at how gargantuan it is, the shadow of a man. Asterion sitting against one of the chamber's walls, looking at you at this beast stretching from your feet. The fire from his eye flickers at you. I got the mirror. Now we can get the hotel back and running, right? He hand it down to Asterion. His fingers graze and curl softly over the bronze. Then he takes it from your hand with a ceremonial grace and cradles it against his chest. You take a good look at Asterion. His fur and shirt are matted with sweat despite the chamber's somewhat chilly temperature. His tail swishes behind them like a rowdy sea. I'm sorry for not con I'm sorry for not informing you early of the foreman. I am truly sorry. I don't know what came over me, master. Don't worry about that. It was no trouble at all. He wanted me to send you out, but I wasn't going along with that, so I had to figure out another way. He wanted food, water, and shelter, but I managed to trick him. Got him to hand me the mirror for nothing at all. If he wants, to use, if he wants me to sign that contract, he'll have to make himself useful. Ah, uh, yes. That is usually what he asks. The snake, he's an all old thing from the labyrinth. His shape changes every now and then. He disappears for a few years at a time, even decades. But the foreman has existed for millennia now. His role, too, is to torture me. Thank you. Asterion hugs the mirror. His fingers brush against its surface, teasing at the cl sharp cold of the metal. He holds it against his chest like something dearly precious. Well then, shall we go back up? Yes, sir. Pardon my slowness. I'm feeling a bit nauseous. This all left me in a panic. Oh, I, I can wait. You sit down beside Asterion, taking a position quite distinct from his, sitting cross-legged in contrast with his knees up. So, did he hurt you back then? Is that why you're afraid of him? He doesn't usually hurt me. He plays games to terrorize me, more often than not, and he sends out worse things to get me. There are horrible things out there. Creatures made by the gods themselves. Argus must be one of them, just gifted with more intelligence than bloodlust. The valley is beautiful, isn't it, Master? It is a sight to behold. But to me it is terrifying. A beautiful place can be hell, too. For millennia I was tortured there. Just being down here makes me sick. Master, would you allow me to speak frankly? You don't have to ask my permission like that. If you want to speak, just do it. I'm giving you my I'm giving you my permission to speak to me freely, whenever you want. Your words cut through the gallery around you, and you hear the now familiar hum coming from the staircase. The world itself shudders in response, as if your words took root and shifted it forcibly. The Minotaur takes notice of this bone chilling change around the both of you. You are quite lenient, Matt, as far as masters go. There weren't many who ever allowed me such freedom, and I ironically, Master Clement was one of the few who did. But that is not what I meant to say. The Minotaur takes a deep breath and averts his gaze from you. Please, never send me out to the valley. I will do anything for you, anything at all. Just don't ask me to do this one thing. You may punish me however you want if I do something wrong, yet if I do everything right, too. I'll take anything. Just please don't make me go out. Yeah, I'll never send you out to the valley. Asterion, look at me. I promise I will never send you out. I can't say I know exactly what they did to you out there. I understand if you don't want to talk about it. But I'll take your word. I won't send you out. I meant what I told you last night. I want to be a good master to you in the hotel. I won't hurt you and I promise I will never send you out. Asterion looks at you with, half -closed, with a half-closed eye. Nausea still twists inside him. And he sways back and forth as if pushed and pulled by the sea's waves. Your words are sweet as honey. A veil, of, a veil of lead falls on the Minotaur. His back gives out and he curls forward, still holding the mirror against his chest. He rests his horns on his knees and lets out a rumbling sigh from the depths of his lungs. Are you feeling alright? Uh, um, I'm just so tired. Just stay here a little while. Take your time. Second, y'all. Asterion groans again. Comfort him. You lay an arm over Asterion's shoulders. Asterion tenses when you touch him, but it only lasts a moment. 
You catch him turning his head slightly to his right, towards you. He responds with a long, deliberate blink, followed by his shoulders relaxing under your arm. Asterion is surprisingly warm. His messy fur doesn't do much to contain his body heat. He leans his head into your arm, taking care not to lay his horn on you. There's half a foot separating the two of you. You scoot closer to him. He looks at you again, and something sparks in his eye. It's starvation for human touch. Asterion has spent decades locked away in a dark room and been going hungry and thirsty, becoming emaciated year after year. You have fed him, clothed him, and tended to his wounds. But a new form of hunger rears its head now, and there's no way he can hide it. Now that you are close, he leans his weight on your shoulder and closes his eye. You pull him closer, accepting all the exhaustion in his bones. At times you feel his eye opening again, shifting to and fro. He wants your warmth, but struggles to give, to give in fully. The battle keeps raging inside him, and the side of, rema of remaining close to you wins out. Asterion mentioned that Master Jean-Marie used to pet him behind his ears. Now he only has one. The way he flicks it at you is, has an inviting quality. You pet him, and he melts on you, nuzzling like a child. Your chest rumbles with a deep sigh that drips out from his throat. You let him doze off on your shoulder for as long as he wants. Eventually, Asterion signals to you he's ready to make his way back upstairs. You have to stop a few times to let Asterion rest, but eventually you do make it up to the ground floor and to the lounge. Within the old lounge, glorious and eaten away by time, you and Asterion find a suit-covered hearth right across from the bar. It is circled by a set of armchairs. Their leather has cracked and dried, but no amount of damage can hide the talent with which they were made. Sunlight falls in front of the hearth, coming through the tall glass windows of the lounge. Asterion kneels before the hearth in a prayer-like position. He lays the mirror aside for a moment and summons logs of, fire, of, fire, of wood and fine dried hay. Then he places the hay at the mirror's focal point. The beam of focused sunlight heats up the hay. You and Asterion wait. Uh, sorry about that, y'all. Decades ago, had the fire gone out, I would have been punished. Tending to it was one of my many duties, and failing to do so was one of the gravest mistakes I could make. Once it is lit again, the hotel will come back to life. This realm is quite unlike the world outside, is it not? It is hard for me to even remember what it was like when I was alive. Back home, when I was just a boy... I went out hunting for wild goats with one of my brothers, finding our own food and bringing it back home. Our father would take, would take me out to the fields. People believed that I would bring them luck and good harvest. Food is harvested or hunted. Wood is chopped down. Homes are built with sweat and stone. But this world operates under different rules. The gods built the world where we, when we were born, knowing well that we were fated to toil and suffer. Such is the fate of man. While you live, shine. Have no grief at all. Life exists only for a short while, and time demands his due. The gods appreciated the suffering of mortals, so they chose instead not to bind this realm by the same rules. If one wishes to inflict pain, he must chop down a tree and work the wood into a spear, then mine, and refine the metal for its head. But here my jailer could summon, break, and summon spears to his heart's content. Why waste time working the land when he could so easily summon all the food his body craves? So too could he bend the rules of life and space itself. The architecture of reality, the master's will, is sovereign. Second, y'all. Water time. As Asterion speaks, the hay twists as it dries further, then darkens and emits a fine smoke. The pure flame will soon be at hand. The gods, however, seldom grasp human ingenuity. Change confuses them. They would, be, they would gladly go by centuries without changing, repeating the same days forever and ever. I saw that with my own eyes. I may be a monster, but I am half-human. Change comes easily to me as well. I have shifted with each century, adapting to my master's will, doing whatever it took. A sliver of fire rises from the hay. Asterion picks it up, not caring for whether or not he gets burned, and places it between the logs. You have kindness in you. But human ingenuity, at times, goes too far. There are things the hotel cannot accomplish no matter how much one tries. Man cannot be made immortal, for starters. The gods would not have been so lenient. Neither can the dead be brought back. The hotel will not make gold or silver in large quantities, and it will never print currency. Most important of all, the realm needs precise instructions on what it is intended to fabricate. As powerful as the master may be here, he can never be made into a god. That is a fundamental rule of the labyrinth.
a pure fire fitting for the gods. The gods are gone. From the stories guests have told over the centuries, it seemed to me that the world outside was well on its way to leaving myth and magic behind. But their power lingers. An offering to them may still be heard, and the labyrinth will never let go of those fundamental rules. A man remains a man. While you live, shine. Have no grief at all. Life exists only for a short while, and time demands his due. Have you listened to that song before, Master? I heard a woman from uh, had a woman from Ephesus sing that. She said her husband wrote it for her when she died. A lot of people took to singing it down there, whether in Elysium or Tartarus. Life is short, for some more than others. They ought to be enjoyed. Whoever bequeathed you the hotel's deed gave you a gift greater than any fortune. This place and I will tend to your needs. You can live a blessed life, and if you allow this place to fulfill its man-made purpose, to give respite to those lost and wandering, it will give your life meaning as well. Even an existence as wretched as mine can have beauty, my lord. I do not quite know why I am telling you all this. I suppose I miss talking, and I feel nervous, and I feel so nervous all of a sudden. Don't worry about that. I like listening to you. This is fine, you know, talking like this in front of the fire. I can't say I've fully figured out how this hotel works and what's going on, but... This is a nice moment, don't you think? Yes, it, it indeed is. The flame looks like any ordinary flame, but something in it pulls your attention to it. For a long time, hours maybe, you and Asterion gaze at it. At the back of your mind, you can hear the hotel creaking and twisting, furniture dragging itself there, here and there, fabric ripping and sewing itself back up. You can just, you can, just at the corners of your vision. Notice the lounge, the lounge remaking itself. The sun drags itself through the sky. At some point, a vague shape materializes between you and Asterion, a wine bottle. The Minotaur is just as sluggish as you, but he manages to pick it up and open it. He offers the bottle to you before taking a sip himself. But you, but you let him have all the, but you let him have all of it. Much like last night, he drinks directly from the bottle. Although this time, he proves better at managing his half-skeletal mouth. But your attention is pulled back to the fire. The flames dim the harder you look until settling down into barely lit embers. Perhaps it's your eyes tricking you, but on the hearth's flame, a scene unfolds. There's a sterian in the lounge. Second, y'all. Water time. Okay. Alright. Back we go. It shifts and sways. At times, it reverts into an archaic tavern, its floor lined with ceramic tiles and its walls covered with barrels of aging wine. Then it leaps ahead to what can only be, what you can only believe is the future, but it is as if the fire is indecisive. At times, you see a classy restaurant and finely dressed patrons, with a wide figure behind the bar. It's a scenic space, but one with an underlying strictness that some should consider stifling, as some could consider stifling. But there is another possibility. A rowdy place, perhaps even lascivious, with a scantily clad man managing it. The kind of place where one would live without unforgettable shenanigans, both disgraceful and re-energizing. These two visions for the lounge seem to struggle against each other. A weight falls on your shoulders. The flames repeat the vision again and again, pushing you to make a choice. The hotel demands an answer. What is your will? What kind of lounge do you want? <laughs> funny and rowdy, perhaps even horny. <laughs> oh god, that's funny. Uh, how about we go with the more conservative approach this time? Y'all actually, you know what, fuck that shit. Uh, I don't know, maybe I should save the fun and rowdy one for not for uh, some of the not safe for work stuff. Hmm. Let's do, uh, oh man. Fun and rowdy, perhaps even horny. That'd be better. Yeah, I'll choose that one for now. There we go. Okay. Let's see what we got. As you make your choice, a sense of finality descends. As if you had broken a seal, or perhaps signed a contract. You're pulled out of your meditation. Asterion looks as well to the fire, unfazed by what happened. I was afraid I'd be locked in there forever. It kept coming back to me. Was this the fate of the gods? Were they locked away somewhere, stuck and forgotten? Is that why they disappeared? If only I could disobey Master Clement's orders. I would have rammed that door down on the very same day he threw me in. But I couldn't. I cannot disobey the Master. Neither can I disobey you. For all those years I thought and thought and thought. There's nothing else I could do. And my body was rotting away. I thought about all that could happen. Every little possibility. 
I wish I could tell you that I dreamed, and indeed at times I allowed myself to hope. But more often than not, I thought about all the bad that could come next. Every possibility. It is difficult for me to believe I am free. At times I catch myself thinking that this must be one of the daydreams. I was certain you'd send me out to the foreman, and it would, be a, and it would all turn into a nightmare. My stomach was turning. I sat down because I couldn't stay up. When you turn, you are greeted with a new sight. A rebuilt lounge. An afternoon sun outside, an entirely different Asterion. Oh wow, he does look different. But it's not a dream. We are here. Alright y'all, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Leave a super thanks or tip if you can, it always helps. Don't forget to check out that Patreon, y'all. Anyway, I love you all. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye